Hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to get us started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, if you can please let us know, you know, where you're joining us, we would really appreciate that. So um, go ahead and drop that in the chat. Um, yeah, so my name is Brianna Roberts, and I am with the Force Marriage Initiative at the Tahari Justice Center. Joining me today are survivor advocate uh, Sarah Tasneen, um, Adriana Lopez, the Director of Client Advocacy with the Tahari Justice Center, and Halit Villegas, who manages the Forced Marriage Initiative. Together, we will facilitate today's webinar titled Engaging Individuals at Risk of Forced Marriage, a training for law enforcement professionals. A little bit about Tahere, um, if you may or may not know our organization. We are a national nonprofit organization that provides free legal services um, to immigrant survivors of gender-based violence. This webinar has live ASL interpretation and Spanish interpretation as well. Uh, in order to get to the Spanish room, uh, please select the global icon towards the bottom right um, corner, um, right near the reactions button, and click on Spanish. Uh, for on today's agenda, we will discuss gender-based violence and define forced marriage along with the intersecting forms um, of abuse that occur within these cases. We will also have the opportunity for case reflection and discussion uh, at the end and towards the end, uh, there will be a deeper dive on the legal landscape of forced marriage and child marriage. Uh, we will then end with screening and responding and understanding the need for a trauma-informed approach. You can go to the next slide. <laughs> Thank you, Brie. I'm, I'm waiting mm -hmm. a few seconds to ensure that our Spanish language audio is, oh, okay. uh, is caught up. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And we would like to thank the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services um, Administration for Family, uh, sorry, for Administration for Children and Families, uh, the Office of Trafficking and Persons for funding this webinar. Before we begin, uh, we would like to launch a poll to gauge everyone's experience working with forced marriage cases. And I will read, oh, the prompt is, have you ever worked with a survivor or potential victim who was facing forced marriage dynamics? The first answer is, is sure, after that is yes, and then no. The answers are still coming in. Um, it looks like that we have about four, um, 15, sorry. Sorry, the answers are still coming in. I'm gonna wait a few seconds. Okay, so there's about 19% that say unsure, 43% say yes, and 40, about 40 says no. I'm glad that um, there's a large group that are recognizing these dynamics um, within their caseload. Yeah, so why are we focusing on law enforcement today? Um, 
As someone who works with potential victims, I often find it necessary to collaborate with law enforcement professionals to ensure a victim's safety. In my current role, I have the opportunity to work directly with survivors and potential victims and explain to um, them about their rights and their options. And during those discussions, sometimes the topic of reporting to law enforcement officers come up. And speaking about potential civil uh, and criminal outcomes. In the process of getting a person to comply with abusive demands, one tactic um, used by perpetrators who are often the family members um, is instilling fear of law enforcement. These fears impact a survivor's um, decision-making and ability to trust, uh, which often can further jeopardize their safety. This fear is not just limited to themselves, but also to their families as well. Um, survivors have often expressed to us that um, they have more hope and um, sense of a better sense of security when law enforcement really understands what they're going through. We find that when we work in partnership with law enforcement agencies to ensure are being respected, while at the same time thinking creatively on how to get the survivor to safety, um, have been some of our more successful cases. And what I mean by creative solutions is thinking outside the box while still um, being within law enforcement responsibilities. Um, in the past, we have worked and collaborated with law enforcement um, and, um, you know, sometimes they allow a potential victim to stay within a precinct until a safe accommodation were found. Sometimes law enforcement may transport a potential victim to a safe shelter. Or law enforcement has conducted wellness checks, sometimes on a frequent basis. These cases um, do have the risk of urgent or unexpected um, travel abroad under false pretenses. Um, so finding ways to avoid travel with law enforcement help um, slash involvement uh, is also something that we collaborate with law enforcement on frequently as well. Um, I would like to pass it to Sarah so she can explain a little bit why she joined us today. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Sarah Tasneem, and um, I'm a survivor of forced child marriage. Um, I advocate publicly to end this practice of forced child marriage here in the United States, um, and I also volunteer as a mentor um, to women and girls who need extra peer emotional support before, during, or after their experiences of forced marriage. Um, my mission, my personal mission is to help end child marriage by raising awareness and by partnering with organizations uh, like Tahri and um, others um, to collaborate on legislative change and to support and uplift many other survivor voices in this process. Um, so yeah, I'm here today to share a little bit about my experience and hope that um, I can make that personal connection between law enforcement and um, where survivor needs are. And with that, I'll pass it on. Hello, this is Adriana. Can you all see me? Yes, Adriana, everything's fine. Perfect, thank you. Um, so thank you, Sara, for that. Um, so we wanted to start with some of the very basics for the uh, presentation. We recognize that some of, the, some of this may be a helpful refresher for some of you and for others in the audience, the content or some of the content that we'll be covering, uh, it will be relatively new. So we wanted to create a 
um, some common language for us to, to engage in conversation today. Uh, the definition we typically use for gender-based violence refers to any harmful acts directed at an individual or a group of individuals based on their gender, their gender expression, their sexuality, etc. This includes physical, sexual, emotional, financial abuse, uh, and deprivation of liberty. The abuse can happen both in the private and the public realm. Uh, we know that gender- Adriana, violence... I'm yes? so sorry, Adriana. This is Halitza. Could you please slow down a little bit for yes. our interpreters? I really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Thank you. You're right. Um, Gender-based violence shows up in every country and in every community, regardless of class, national origin, race, ethnicity, or religion. It is perhaps one of the most visible effects of gender inequality, so we know that it does not happen in a vacuum. There are laws, gaps in laws, norms that create the environment for gender-based violence to happen, like the issue of forced marriage, which we'll be talking about today. Next slide. So uh, within the context of forced marriage, uh, this is a helpful visual to illustrate how the larger community and societal level factors across cultures and communities are really at the root of why forced marriage exists. We're talking about um, rigid customs, norms, and traditions. We're talking about poverty and inequality. We're talking about control over female sexuality. Um, and then on the um, magnifying glass, you see the individual and family level triggers that are unique and specific to each case that often act as a motivator um, for uh, or a trigger for a forced marriage. Here, we're talking about somebody being perceived as too westernized. We're talking about uh, someone um, you know, experiencing rape or sexual assault. Uh, we're talking about um, having contact with the opposite sex, identifying as part of the LGBTQIA uh, plus community. Re rejecting religion, prioritizing work or education above uh, what is what may be perceived as more acceptable roles based on gender, uh, particularly, you know, uh, with trying to be rigid about the roles that women play in society. And so it is it would be uh, common, for example, for a woman or a girl who comes from a community with strong uh, feelings towards control of female sexuality or rumors about prom promiscuity or even the perception of that then leads that family to move ahead with the marriage process to save their reputation. Next slide. Thank you, Adriana, for the explanation of uh, gender-based violence and the root causes. Um, next, I will take this opportunity to explain what forced marriage is and what it is not. So this slide illustrates the definition that grounds us with in the work that we do. When we say forced marriage, what we mean is a forced marriage is one where one or both people do not or cannot consent to the marriage and typically involves elements of forced fraud or coercion. We do not equate forced marriage with arranged marriage. The arranged marriage is a process in which families may take the lead, but the ultimate choice to marry remains with the individual. We understand that this is our working definition and that individuals with lived experiences may describe or label their situation differently, um, or they may use terminology interchangeably. So it's important that we give the individual space um, to name their situation um, for themselves and not to pressure them into labeling it um, and, you know, 
recognizing that regardless of the terminology that is used, what we are looking for is understanding if there is um, free and full consent in the relationship um, and or during the marriage process. This next graphic, um, which was provided to us by Vidya Suri, who is a survivor who was at Harvard at the time she created this continuum, and Dairakshan Raja, who worked at the Urban Institute at the time, um, gives us a better idea as to how one loses consent throughout the marriage um, process over time. It's not a perfect image, um, but it helps us to um, get a better idea that a person can begin in what feels like their arranged marriage process, but then over time they find that their ability to express their preferences uh, or concerns or to reject suitors um, altogether being dismissed. Um, forced marriage cases do have the tendency to escalate very quickly. Um, a victim of forced marriage may start out at stage one and due to individual family triggers that Adriana just explained, uh, a family could escalate the process to stage eight in a matter of days. Uh, there are many cases where a potential victim knows that a forced marriage will happen in the future, but there are no actionable offenses occurring at the time they are reaching out for support. So when you think about this continuum, a potential victim could reach out to you at stage one. Um, so it's important to think, what can your agency do at all stages um, of this continuum to provide support? Um, to a potential victim. Are there other crimes occurring um, that you act on um, or provide support in the meantime? Um, this type of abuse does not happen in the silo and uh, there could be other crimes occurring um, leading up to the marriage itself. Um, next, I will pass it to Halitz who will provide us a deeper dive on consent. Thank you so much, Brianna. Hello again, everyone. I'm Halit Vijegas. She, her, Eja. I manage the Forced Marriage Initiative and work closely uh, with my colleagues here, in particular with Brianna, uh, serving uh, survivors directly. And so uh, as we think about uh, consent, uh, I think that a, a key piece that often is forgotten when it comes to situations of, of uh, relationships and or marriage is the fact that consent uh, should be or needs to be multifaceted. When we're speaking about consent, it is not just about the person who uh, the survivor the, or the potential victim may be introduced to, uh, but it, it is about the entire aspect of marriage altogether. And so it is even the idea of marriage, right? Do folks have an opportunity to think, to decide if this is something that they want for themselves or not? And as Brianna mentioned, freely express wishes without fear of harm or any other repercussions, right? Uh, it is about the timing of marriage as well, right? Perhaps they are, um, you know, okay with family or, or, or parents being involved involved in a marriage process, but they are moving forward uh, in a timeline that was not agreed upon. And so when we think about consent again, it is at all levels expressing wishes freely. Uh, and that means, again, uh, that fear of negative consequences uh, is not there. That yes, they do want to you know, marry and yes to the person they are being introduced to and yes to the timeline that is, um, is being um, discussed. To think uh, more about consent, you know, or, or what lack of consent can look like, you know, an individual may be younger than the you know, legal age to marry. We've seen situations where there's lack of consent, uh, given that the person was um, 
a subject to incapacity or a disability that impacts their ability to fully understand what they were agreeing to or fully understand you know, what is the marriage process altogether. And of course, as a definition that Brianna mentioned, you know, seeing those elements of force, of fraud, or coercion. Some common examples uh, used, uh, you know, using force, fraud, or coercion that we have seen are, you know, family members or parents in these particular cases stating that, you know, they will, they will harm themselves, they will end their own life. So they're not maybe necessarily harming the, uh, the individual at risk directly or that potential victim, but the threats to self, right? And that, and that potential victim feeling that they are responsible if that harm uh, occurs being told that if the marriage does not happen, that they will lose that financial support. We have seen situations where uh, partners or other uh, individuals who perpetrate abuse threaten to share explicit pictures if they do not agree to marriage or to remain in a marriage that um, is non-consensual. And we have also learned of individuals signing documents that they do not understand, whether it be in a different language or just they do not understand. And then they find themselves, you know, surprised to actually be uh, legally married. I mentioned, you know, that lack of consent, uh, you know, can also be because a person is younger than the lawful age, you know, to marry, but I, you know, would not be doing this issue justice if I did not share that, you know, in the United States, there are, you know, the majority of the states, you know, child marriage is legal. And though we cannot say at Tahere that every child marriage is a forced marriage, you know, situation, we recognize that the data tells us that the majority of these cases have very concerning factors. We know that the data shows that the majority of these cases involve young girls who are marrying adult men. And in some situations, those men are decades and decades older. We know that in some situations, the marriage ages are lower than the age of consent, meaning that we have uh, some states where girls are marrying before they lawfully could consent. And in situations of forced marriage or you know, forced child marriage, you know, parents tend to be the primary perpetrators or family members, loved ones, right? And so when we have states where there is this parental consent um, that are, ex are um, enable, you know, marriage, these exceptions can enable what we see as parental coercion. You know, the, the good news here is that since you know, Tahere launched the first campaign in 2016, the movement to end child marriage has truly grown. We have seen many states strengthen their laws. We continue to advocate for change. And uh, we're very excited to also see many survivors and survivor advocates really leading the charge on uh, changes um, in, in their individual states. I'd like to pass it to um, Sara to share a bit more about her work in the child marriage campaign and more about her story. Sara, could you join us? Hi, everybody. Can you hear and see me okay? Okay. Um, so, yeah, so a little bit about me. Um, I'll talk a little bit about my story, first of all, and then um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about my advocacy after that. Um, so at 15 years old, um, I was living with my mom in Colorado. My parents had been divorced at that time. And um, I was sent to visit my dad in, um, in California from Colorado. Um, during that summer visit, my dad introduced me to a man one morning. And I was told that I was going to marry him that night. Um, I was told that this was my fault um, and it was because I had a boyfriend back home in Colorado and in order to, for me to follow my religion I had to marry somebody and it had to be somebody that my dad and his uh, the leader of his spiritual group chose for me um, so after a brief 
meeting with uh, a 28 year old man who was 13 years older than me, I was given away to this man in a spiritual wedding ceremony. I was 15 years old at the time. I had no idea uh, what I was agreeing to or um, what the implications of that would be. Um, that man was actually able to take me out of the country, leave with me and rape me for the next six months. We returned back to California six months after that, um, where in California, the statutory, um, the age for consent is actually 18 years old. So he was committing a crime at that point in time. However, um, I felt that at every step along this process, it didn't feel as if the adults or people in charge um, noticed that this was um, a rape or if it was consensual. Um, and there were many touch points along the way. Um, I could have been stopped uh, when my passport was stamped. I could have um, been stopped when I, you know, was visiting the doctor's office or various steps along the way. But in fact, I was never stopped or asked if this was something that I wanted. Um, six months after our spiritual ceremony, I was legally married to my rapist at 16 and six months pregnant. At that point, there was nothing that my mom or anybody else could do because now I was entered into a legal marriage. Um, and the issue with that is that I was not able to leave. Had I wanted to leave, I would have been turned away from domestic violence shelters in my state of California. Um, I wouldn't have been able to hire an attorney uh, because I wasn't um, an adult. And I wouldn't have been able to even walk out the door because in many cases, uh, minors are treated as runaways if they're reported. And so I would have been returned back to my abuser. It took me seven long years to be able to separate from my ex and then three years to finalize my divorce. There are just so many barriers that stand in the way of children being able to leave these abusive marriages. And that's why I advocate to, to end child marriage completely um, under the age of 18 without exception um, because of the horrors that I have had to endure and because of, sadly, because of hundreds of other hundreds of thousands of other survivors here um, in the United States that also suffer similar fates. Um, so a little bit about my advocacy. I started um, in 2017, I started advocating to end child marriage after um, I started going back to school. I had left my marriage and I was in a safe place. And um, actually I saw Tahrey uh, Justice Center where was asking for survivor stories and I submitted my story there and started working um, alongside them, sharing my story and advocating to end this um, horrific abuse um, across the United States. Um, where there are legislative efforts, I show up and I share my story um, as testimony, as, as, pus as public testimony. And I also um, help as a peer mentor support. I volunteer as a peer mentor support um, for other survivors. Um, and since my since I started my advocacy journey, 13 states have actually ended child marriage. And we are hopeful that we can continue to um, chip away at the 38 states that that still have laws on the books that um, allow for for forms of child marriage to happen. Sara, thank you so much for sharing more about your lived experience and um, giving us an opportunity to, uh, with your sharing, to think about ways that perhaps, um, you know, those who are attending today uh, can think about their role, how they may encounter a survivor or a potential victim, uh, and, and many different touch points, right? You mentioned the, you know, the airport, right? Uh, the, you know, the court system, uh, perhaps if there was ever any sort of wellness check or welfare check, 
um, to your home or uh, as you mentioned, right, in seeking any you know, medical care, right, the assumption that, um, you know, you're perhaps there, um, you know, out, out of your free free will. I, I really appreciate you sharing that and, and giving us, I think, a, a you know, survivor-centered framing as we think about, you know, this uh, webinar and the potential advocacy that we can all support. Thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. Um, I will will move us ahead a bit to you know go along with what I think Sarah you know mentioned and what my colleagues have shared. Um, you know, when an individual feels they have no real choice when it comes to marriage, they lose, as Sarah mentioned in her in, in her brief. And I, and I emphasize brief mention of her lived experience, right? There's so much more that we all, um, uh, I'm sure, can, can know that um, is part of, um, of that experience. You know, uh, folks lose a great deal of power and control of their own life. And what we're trying to achieve with this section is to really drive home the fact that forced marriage is a form of violence. It's a form of violence on its own. But the truth of the matter is that forced marriage is not ever happening on its own. It tends to uh, intersect with a lifetime um, experience of child abuse, of neglect, of grooming, of rape and sexual assault, domestic violence, family violence, and stalking. In some communities, it can also intersect with female genital cutting. And, um, you know, we'll take a deeper dive on that in, during, this, during the, uh, the presentation, uh, but in, in focus on how there's the intersection with human trafficking. And also how there are elements of um, of trafficking that uh, where forced marriage is used uh, as a, an accompanying type of um, of harm. When someone discloses being threatened with forced marriage, you know they are um, you know again likely some component uh, crimes, other forms of abuse that have occurred. Uh, which I think is truly the, the helpful tool here as we think about how to provide someone with support and the sort of questioning that you may need to uncover those type of accompanying harms, right? That additional abuse that could be happening that may have been present in order to get the person to comply or to remain in the marriage. And just to unpack this a little bit more, you know, no matter, you know, what age someone has come to the forced marriage initiative for help, we um, have certainly heard from those we serve that, um, you know, the, the discussions regarding marriage, uh, you know, has happened, um, you know, at all ages, at all uh, moments. And there's an, um, they have experienced a lifetime um, of um, oppression in their household. There's expectation settings that happen um, when they our children are early on, and especially that control, right, of the marriage process. Sometimes uh, what they are told that they will be taken out of school if they refuse to marry someone of their family's choosing. Uh, we've seen some cases where there's been restrict, they have been restricted from food, from other activities, again, in order to get them to, you know, acquiesce to what the family wants um, for them. And these are, you know, situations where it may not be so clear that it is, you know, child abuse. And again, it goes back to that piece of what are the questions that we are asking? How can we ask more detailed questions about the entire experience of, of, of someone with their family to be able to uncover, uh, you know, these potential um, other forms of, of abuse, potential crimes, uh, that put a, that could you know help someone uh, receive the resources and the support and the safety that they deserve. When it comes to rape and sexual assault, you know we 
have seen this um, unfortunately be used as uh, a cause and also a consequence of forced marriage. And what I mean by this is that in certain cases, uh, someone will experience a rape or a sexual assault and that particular family or or maybe the community they come from, whatever that may be, may see the way to, you know, fix the situation um, by moving forward with marriage and, and or potentially even protect the perpetrator from prosecution by um, utilizing marriage. There are certainly, um, I, I think we all, uh, can recognize or I hope we recognize that if someone is entering into a marriage that they never wanted to be in the first place, uh, then whatever happens within that marriage, those sexual acts are, are non-consensual. And unfortunately, you know, consummation is often expected um, and, and, and survivors, uh, folks at risk, victims, uh, they face, you know, a lifelong issues with access to, um, you know, their reproductive health um, and access just to really to, to their own body and consent over their body. I think domestic and family violence is a pretty um, easy form of, of abuse uh, to, to understand how forced marriage intersects, right? When we think about what Brianna shared uh, regarding the definition, right, of force, fraud, of coercion, when we think about the ways that families uh, may um, utilize coercive tactics, which we'll talk about um, a bit ahead of the presentation, it's, uh, it's, it, incredibly similar to the, that, um, the domestic and family violence um, discussions that we have relating to power and control and imbalance, right? And we're also talking about it is family. It is, you know, uh, individuals, uh, you know, most loved ones who are perpetrating, um, you know, this this um, type of harm. So I won't spend uh, more time on, on that, but we, again, we certainly want to highlight the connection to the domestic and family violence, um, uh, you know, sphere. Stalking is a, um, a I would say, a unique type of, of, of of harm, or actually the the way that stalking occurs in, in these cases, uh, it's a bit different than what um, we we typically are used to when we think about stalking. Often, the the individuals who we are supporting or those at risk, you know, they go to school with family members, or they go to the same houses of worship, they go to the same you know church or temple. They are around you know, the same community. And that close proximity is what then is reported constantly to maybe that head of household who could be that most abusive person, um, or that close proximity is utilized as a way for their family to keep an eye on, um, on that person and to really uh, give them the, um, the fear that we're no matter what, there's always someone watching, right? So they better stay in line. And how could you, you know, even think about asking for help because everything will be reported back. And we have had clients that they say that they, you know, were talking to a friend in school or talking to a counselor or a resource officer and the family member saw them, right? And that was reported back. And very quickly, that person was, you know, removed from school or kept at home and or um, situations escalate greater um, when there are moments of, um, when there are moments um, when travel abroad could be present. So again, and the, these are moments where everything that that person is doing, that individual at risk, uh, is being reported back, right, to those potential perpetrators. And there is no way for them to think or see that they could have um, any sort of help. Female genital uh, 
uh, mutilation or cutting is really a whole presentation in itself. Uh, but we uh, have to, you know, flag that in situations where you could be uh, uh, encountering or working with someone where you're screening for uh, uh, female genital cutting, uh, you should certainly be screening and asking questions related to forced marriage. Um, it's uh, not something that uh, will be, you know, a, a perfect connection for, for everyone, but there are certainly some communities where uh, female genital cutting is a, per a precursor to a marriage. And again, if you're screening for female genital mutilation or cutting, or someone um, at risk is flagging this uh, type of harm, uh, you will want to screen for forced marriage to ensure that that person is receiving the full resources or benefits or support that they truly need. And so, that to get to the, I think, a, a core piece of this presentation, which is, is enforced marriage, you know, just a form of human trafficking or uh, just a form of family perpetrated trafficking? That question come, you know, comes up often. And, you know, what we see in our work is that, you know, often the dynamics do not rise to the level of state or federal definitions um, of trafficking. We're not seeing the exploitation or financial gain as a primary motivator. And while there can be things like bride prices or a relief of a debt discussed, um, often, again, that monetary gain is not the main um, motivator or that main trigger for family to pressure that person into marriage. That said, we certainly see the connection and have seen elements of trafficking when we're looking at situations that manifest much more like, um, you know, servile marriage. So, for example, someone is married and then they're sent to live in their spouse's, um, you know, family home with in-laws or extended family, and they're forced to work you know, without rest, they're forced to work, you know, morning to night, uh, day in and day out, there's domestic work, watching children, they're not allowed to rest, they're not giving any sort of compensation. And, uh, you know, for that, you know, that labor. And so we see in some of those situations, certainly where there could be that, that dynamic and, and enforced labor. We've also have had, you know, cases where, individuals, you know, are married, and then they're forced to work without, again, compensation, without rest, and maybe other folks in the business, um, you know, are getting compensated and are getting rest, but, you know, but um, the, the person at risk or the, you know, the victim is not receiving, again, that compensation, and they're working now uh, forced to work at a family business. But again, you know, it's very important to recognize that there are moments where, yes, these, um, the, you know, forced marriage and trafficking can overlap uh, because recognizing that overlap can, can um, open doors to services that are available for survivors of, um, of human trafficking, right? And vice versa, right? It's important to recognize that if someone is a, a victim of human trafficking and uh, for, is forced marriage being used as a way to you know, keep them in, in that situation, right? And so it's important to acknowledge both. And I think that this uh, you know, Venn diagram helps us to you know, wrap our, our heads around the similarities, uh, but also to, to see those differences. You know, I, I think a, a, a very important piece of this equation, of this uh, intersection, you know, is that many times forced marriage is an abusive act that is performed through legal systems. There's, um, it's, it's very difficult to, um, to explain, you know, ex exploitation uh, under the guise of marriage, it's, it's difficult for survivors to name. Um, and as well as for all of the systems that perhaps are working with survivors to be able to recognize uh, and pull apart all of these um, 
the dynamics. Brianna, I'd like to pass it to you to share a bit more about the action means and, and purpose model. Yes, thank you, Halitz, for that intro to human trafficking and forced marriage. Um, so this is the action means purpose model, uh, which is a tool used to determine whether a situation fits the federal definition of human trafficking. Uh, so as some of you guys may know, um, human trafficking occurs when the perpetrator, often referred to as a trafficker, uh, takes any one of the elements under the actions columns and employs um, the means of force, fraud, or coercion uh, for the purpose of compelling a potential victim to engage in commercial sex um, or labor services. At a minimum, one element from each column must be present in order to um, establish a potential human trafficking situation. Uh, the presence of force, fraud, and coercion, you know, often indicates that a victim has not consented on their own free will. To be clear, we are speaking about adults here. Um, you know, under the federal law, any minor induced to um, induced into commercial sex is considered a victim of sex trafficking, regardless of the force, fraud, or coercion piece. But um, relating that to forced marriage cases, the perpetrators of harm um, often use similar tactics um, from both the action and the means column to get the victims to comply with abusive demands. Um, however, the purpose, you know, can vary, and at times the purpose um, is not for um, commercial sex or labor practice or exploitive labor in mind. Um, so this brings us to what we are actually seeing in our cases. I do want to recognize, you know, as Halich mentioned, that you know, there are elements of bride prices, paying dowry, or paying off a debt as being a reason that, um, you know, someone is being forced to marry. Um, however, the financial gain is often not the main motivator of the marriage. So societal standards on marriage, meaning, um, you know, the best time or the best age for an individual to get married by and to who, um, you know, that could be people within the same race, religion, social economic status, um, and individual family views and values of marriage all impact the decision to pressure a person um, into a marriage. Um, so I have seen cases where marriage is used to correct certain um, types of quote unquote bad behaviors. Um, or it's used as a misguided attempt to secure a better future for the child. Um, and there are many other reasons not um, with the purposes of exploitation in mind. But this does not dismiss cases where um, financial exploitation is at the forefront of the decision-making process. So we have worked on cases where the exchange of money or something of value um, was given to ensure, to secure um, a marriage. Given that dynamic, uh, we have been able to connect survivors to human trafficking resources where they otherwise may not have qualified for um, certain programs. Um, I can think of a few cases where the marriage did not rise to the level of traditional domestic violence and the access a dom domestic violence shelter. Um, so that's why, you know, I'm grateful when there is that trafficking, the intersection of trafficking and forced marriage that, you know, they can access um, that resources and it just gives them more um, opportunities to access a wider range of services. Um, we covered a lot thus far, uh, and I want to pass it back to Halitz to, you know, guide us on reflection of the material that's been covered um, up until now. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Brianna, and I'll, I welcome my colleagues, uh, uh, Adriana and, and Sarah, to join if there's anything you'd like to reflect on. I'm also looking, you know, uh, at at the time, and I know there's a lot more to cover. Um, and as I did want to um, just uh, clarify a piece uh, from 
the the last sec um section that was just covered regarding uh, resources, right? You know, we certainly see um, uh, the ways where uh, this issue connects with domestic and the family violence, right? Um, you know, uh, movement. And as Brianna mentioned, you know, explaining to folks where perhaps there are some benefits in being um, uh, named a trafficking survivor uh, can be critical, right? And, and those folks may not name their situation as uh, trafficking, um, they may not want that for themselves or their family, it is helpful to be able to explain if there's any potential benefits because they, they may not know about them. And even in situations where um, where the definition is not quite met, I certainly have seen in my work with survivors that trafficking resources have been very helpful in supporting these survivors and in thinking about, you know, the full spectrum of trauma that folks um, experience. And so I don't want to dismiss the benefits that uh, there could be, while at the same time, I do think it's important to recognize that survivors may not name their situation as trafficking, and there could be uh, lots of fear um, in thinking about the, the criminal repercussions if their families are uh, considered, um, you know, traffickers. Sada, I saw you come on, and I'd like to give you a minute before I move us to the legal landscape. Yeah, so um, in talking about uh, trafficking, I just wanted to kind of go back and relate it from my perspective as a survivor. Um, I was also, you know, taken out of school at the age of 15. Um, so that left me with no real options to work outside of the home or opportunity to make my own money. Um, and because of that, I was forced into doing domestic labor um, at the hands of my abuser. So there, I definitely see that aspect in relation to my own uh, personal story. And um, the other um, thing that you had touched on earlier, Brianna, was the domestic violence aspect. And uh, one of the things when I was doing my own personal research on this issue, um, I, I did my thesis on um, on services for uh, for minors in the, in these types of situations, and I found that um, one law enforcement agency in particular um, had created um, just a questionnaire of 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 questions that they would ask uh, domestic violence victims when they first encountered them, which would have been super useful for me because I had called the cops at one point, and um, this one simple question was, "How old were you at the age of your marriage?" Um, that would have been huge for me if a law enforcement officer were to have asked me that because it would have it would have helped me reflect on that power dynamic. So I just kind of wanted to highlight that situation. And at any touch point along the way, if law enforcement is able to um, uncover that uh, that type of abuse, it's it's really impactful for survivors, I think. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that. And thank you. Thank you so much. I, I think your perspective is um, critical and, and very important to, to share and for, for all of us, again, to think about um, how we come in contact with, with survivors, individuals at risk, potential victims, and how we can enhance our um, intake assessment protocols, the questions that we ask, and how we can incorporate questions related to marriage and, and not make uh, so many assumptions. I am going to move us into, um, you know, the legal landscape. You know, this section can certainly be a training in itself. Um, and if you are interested in a, in a training specifically focused on this, or maybe even a round table uh, for us to truly discuss laws in a deeper dive, we're happy to do so. Please let us know uh, what in the post um, webinar survey. We would love to uh, engage, you know, you all further, and and to have um, your expertise, and and have this, um, you know, more of a consultation. And so this section, I'm going to give an overview of the laws and encourage you again to think about your specific role, how you encounter survivors or potential victims, and how the knowledge of the intersection of forced marriage with other forms of abuse with other with crimes could enhance your practices, how you question potential victims, how you engage with them um, overall. 
federal laws give us some avenues in sharing rights-based education and, again, those potential avenues for support, right? So looking at, um, you know, the domestic violence, child abuse, uh, stalking, right? The, the laws that we have briefly dis, uh, discussed at that intersection, they can, they can certainly support our work as we think about how uh, to offer um, resources, support, and our potentially um, uh, identify uh, other other ways of um, of maybe of accountability. Um, uh, but I'll I'll name and and I'm sharing this because I saw um, you know in the uh, the questions that we received. Um, regarding this section, um, I saw questions related to, you know, criminal law and would that be beneficial? You know, from we've done consultation with partners with survivors on this issue, and I'll name that, you know, we're not certain that federal criminal law will bring in, you know, enough benefits. And there is a fear amongst service providers, amongst advocates, that a strictly criminal approach to this issue will keep potential victims from disclosing and um, further isolate them from, you know, help-seeking services. Recognizing that it's not the uh, view of every single, you know, survivor or every organization who works on this issue, but I do think it is incredibly important to name uh, Brianna, if you haven't done so um, already, I would appreciate it if you would uh, put in the chat a few of the links for our legal uh, resources. And so as I move us ahead, you know, the issue of forced marriage was directly addressed in the 2022 reauthorization of VAWA. This was for the first time in history defining forced marriage as a form of harm that is occurring in the United States. And that, we believe, it can open the doors for new recognition, uh, for potential funding streams to support this work directly and the survivors specifically. I think an indirect way that the issue has been addressed is at the federal level with the repeal of the spousal defense to statutory rape. Uh, but frankly, the, the United States um, law is truly at the beginning stages of addressing this issue. When we're you know, thinking about um, you know, the federal government, there are some unclear messaging uh, with agency guidelines, with the funding priorities, and even statements regarding where we stand on child marriage. The U.S. state law um, uh, and marriage-based immigration policies appear to sanction and facilitate child marriage. And then U.S. foreign policy uh, posture takes, you know, a different stance. In fact, the U.S. foreign policy is filled with the understanding that child marriage is harmful wherever it occurs and that it should be prevented. And so, for example, the U.S. Department of State Foreign Affairs Manual states that the U.S. government considers forced marriage to be a violation of basic human rights. It also considers that forced marriage of a minor uh, child to be a form of child abuse since the child will presumably be subject to non-consensual sex. And it is not just U.S. citizens who are at risk of child marriage in the United States. Currently, there is no minimum age set by law for a foreign beneficiary spouse or fiance. And in uh, the year 2019, the U.S. Senate Homeland Security and Government Affairs Committee published the um, how the U.S. immigration system encourages child marriages report, which revealed uh, the approval of more than 8,500 marriage-based uh, visa petitions that involved at least one minor. Uh, you know, we are actively pursuing policy change on this matter and hope to, um, you know, be able to share more um, from the consultations that we've done and what we think, you know, the, the steps that, you know, the federal government can take to, um, you know, you know, maybe set the course, set the norm, uh, and and in incentivize right states to um, uh, do more um, on this issue. 
And although you know a, a number of states, as well as the District of Columbia and the U.S. Virgin Islands, have statutes that criminalize forcing someone into marriage in some uh, circumstances, you know these laws seem to be designated for other purposes than um, to prevent parents or to punish parents uh, for forcing their children into marriage, right? Um, some of these laws are, um, you know, are tucked into those sections related to uh, seduction or defilement, or they're connected to um, uh, prostitution. And they do not necessarily address this issue in the way that survivors or those at risk are naming their experience. Some of these laws are centuries old, and we've seen some states that have repealed uh, or eliminated those laws altogether because prosecutors were not necessarily using them. At Tahere, we do not know of any recent prosecution that has been brought under forced marriage criminal statutes in the United States, to be clear, um, against parents. Um, instead, what we have seen is when charges have been brought um, for forced marriage, it is because uh, the facts satisfy elements of another crime, such as rape, abduction, child endangerment. And in fact, prosecutors being in, may prefer charging under those statutes uh, as they do not require proof of the perpetrator's intent to force someone into marriage. And so we see these laws uh, as most useful, especially for law enforcement professionals uh, to, and potential uh, victims to use as a negotiating tool to perhaps delay or to stop an unwanted marriage. Right. We work with individuals whose parents, uh, you know, did not want to be involved with, you know, with the legal systems. And I can actually think of a case where um, uh, in one of these states where a woman was taken to her parents home country and she had connected with our program and law enforcement um, and we were working together and um, law enforcement officers went to that family home. They outlined the law and the potential crimes that this family could be um, committing. And I remember clearly them stating, you know, you have not committed a crime yet, but if you do not return um, you know, your daughter within you know, 48 hours unharmed and unmarried, these are the, the crimes we're going to move forward with. These are the charges that will come. And I can say for certain that that, um, uh, you know, uh, scare tactic, for lack of other words, would have actually led to some, you know, criminal penalties. But what I do know is that it was a powerful negotiating tool and that that woman did come back and she was unharmed and unmarried. And so this is, is um, important to note as we think about again, you know, well, you know, if we're solely relying or hoping for forced marriage specific laws, uh, I don't know if that would have, uh, you know, fully you know, true value add. Uh, we, we need to be creative as we think about utilizing the tools that we have now and uh, remember that there are many survivors who will be hesitant to involve law enforcement um, uh, particularly as they think about the criminal consequences for their loved ones. Uh, I'm going to move us ahead for the sake of time. You know, I'm including in this presentation a couple of innovative approaches like in Tennessee, which is a, a, a new uh, 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 approach uh, gives survivors, I think, a clear recognition of the harms done, opportunity to hold perpetrators accountable in um, in civil court. You know, as we think about you know um, innovation and creative approaches, uh, we we. Uh, would not do this issue justice if we did not discuss, uh, you know, the movement to end child marriage. And, you know, Sarah had mentioned her advocacy. There are 13 states where, you know, child marriage is completely banned. Uh, we have, um, you know, a, um, a report that outlines this a bit better, where better explains what these colors mean on this map. Uh, again, I'll name that, you know, we are, we are proud of the movement. We are proud of the survivors who are taking the lead 
in making these um, this change and all of you who are here and taking um, you know this this webinar and being interested on this issue and as hopefully you can think about ways to improve uh, uh, things in, in your state and with the survivors that you, your team or colleagues may potentially be um, encountering. So if it's okay with you, I'm going to move us ahead, uh, given that we've discussed a bit about um, the advocacy already. Yeah. As we think about innovative approaches, uh, another uh, 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 moment, I think, of pride in, in our work, and though Texas is not an 18 no exception state, uh, during the 2017 legislation, they were able to uh, update uh, their child abuse definition. And it now includes forcing or coercing a child to enter into marriage. And for again, for us, this is huge as we think about, uh, you know, the the adults who could potentially protect, you know, a, a minor, and how this uh, makes it very clear that forced child marriage falls within the mandates of family and protective services. And so if you're joining us from Texas, this is uh, critical for you to know. If you're not, uh, you know, in, in Texas, this is another innovative approach as you think about, again, the work that you're doing in, in your state and potential avenues for um, bringing more uh, protection for uh, survivors and individuals um, who may be at risk. To ensure that we have uh, enough time to deep dive um, on the, the trauma and screening and responding discussions that are critical to properly support survivors, I am going to um, move us ahead from this video, but I'll be sure to include the link with uh, the materials that are shared. Uh, I'm going to pause here, although we're not giving reflections on the video. Uh, I'd like to pause to see if any of my colleagues, if Adriana, Sara, um, or Brianna would like to add anything before we dive into the screening and responding um, section. Adriana or Brianna, is there anything in the um, in the chat that may be worth mentioning at this moment? Yeah, we have a few questions. Um, the first one what? is. Oh, I'm so sorry. Um, um, uh, Brianna, I, I wonder if there's any sort of moments of reflection questions, If we, because I want to make sure that your section and Adriana's section has enough time, I like to hold us for to the end, unless there's something that perhaps could be cleared from the most recent discussion that we had. Um, I don't believe on my end. Okay. I don't think so either. Yeah, okay. All right, well, thank you uh, both and thanks everyone who has uh, participated in um, in the chat. Um, I will go ahead and pass it to uh, my colleague to share more about what screening and responding looks like and case dynamics. Brianna, I'll pass it to you. Yes, thank you, Halit. Uh, yeah, so we are extremely thankful that we are giving the opportunity to further discuss case dynamics and warning signs. Um, and to provide some helpful tips that you can use or implement within your day-to-day -day investigative practices. Um, so it's often rare that an individual uh, reaches out to law enforcement directly to report their case. Uh, the potential victim is putting a great deal of trust into the system um, and hoping that their situation will get handled with as much grace, um, understanding, um, and care as possible. Um, as you know, law enforcement, you are you are in a unique position to help reduce re, um, victimization and trauma, and providing um, you know individuals at risk with a safe um, safe 
um, space to freely express their concerns. Um, so when you get called onto a scene for a domestic um, dispute, separating all parties to ensure that they can freely express themselves without, um, you know, fear of censorship. Um, and, you know, and just knowing if your agency is part of a local task force or if they have an MOU with a local service provider that you can get uh, an individual connected with. Um, and potential victims are often reaching out before a marriage takes place. So traditional forms of abuse uh, may not be present in the case at the time that they're reaching out. Um, and there's no evidence of harm happening besides their intuition. Yeah, so throughout a survivor's case, they face a broad range of coercive tactics um, that often impact or prevent their um, their ability to make a decision or to seek supportive services. Uh, they're often being told that they are ruining their family's reputation. They may be ruining their, sis their younger sister's prospects of marriage. Uh, if they decide to leave home, um, they may be leaving home their entire social network um, and support network as well. And this is not just their individual family, but this is their community, any religious um, institutions that they are part of, school, you know, things of that nature. Um, potential victims are sometimes threatened with deportation and told that they might be sent back to the family's home country and they might be unfamiliar with you know the system the immigration system their rights even if they're a u.s citizen or have permanent status um, and there's also threats to you know themselves and to loved ones as well and sometimes pets um oh if you can go back just one slide. Abri, we need to oh, um, oh, okay. move ahead. Um, so if you could uh, give us an overview of warning signs. Yeah, sure. Um, that way we can go ahead and pass it to Adriana. Okay, sure. Uh, and then um, for law enforcement, I, you know, just want to focus on the law enforcement column. Um, you know, having a history of domestic violence, um, you know, present in reports uh, may be an indicator that um, force or violence is likely to occur um, when enforcing parents or other people of authority's decisions. Um, so we often see false reports to the police after um, an individual has decided to flee or relocate for their own safety. Unfortunately, families are often very savvy and they know how to paint a sympathetic picture of themselves as being concerned parents, missing for uh, missing a, a missing child, um, or sometimes they may frame the potential victim as a perpetrator. Um, so they can be framed as a drug user, juvenile delinquent, sometimes a sex worker, um, or a frequent runaway. So um, they use law enforcement to have the individual return home to the family. And, um, you know, just important to recognize um, and to know your state and agencies like arrest policies as well to avoid um, re-traumatizing them. And then for this slide, this is just a few additional warning signs that um, I won't get into a deeper dive just for the sake of time. Um, but if you want more information, you can visit our website at preventforcemarriage.org. I'll pass it off to Adriana now. Thank you, Bree, for that uh, helpful summary, and Halid and Sarah for walking us through, uh, you know, specific, um, highlighting the specific dynamics within uh, forced marriage. So I, our team has been talking a lot about these, you know, case dynamics, things that show up within the context of forced marriage, um, and, um, you know, I wanted to kind of like um, make the connections for people and how these signs and behaviors and dynamics that show up are actually stemming from trauma and how they may influence the way uh, survivors interact with law enforcement during interviews or during the course of an investigation. Uh, so what is trauma? Uh, trauma or individual trauma uh, results from an event, series of events, or sets of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or life-threatening and that has lasting effects 
on an individual's functioning, their mental, physical, social, emotional, and spiritual well-being. Here, we are talking about trauma um, that is so, so overwhelming for that person's body and mind that it pushes that person outside of that window of tolerance that all of us have to cope with the day-to-day -day stress. Um, you know, my my uh, colleague, uh, Brianna, was talking a little bit, uh, and I think Elise also talked a little bit about how um, uh, a parent um dying uh may uh trigger somebody um uh being forced into uh into a marriage and you know in and of itself uh anybody but especially a young person uh whose parent has passed away that in itself is a traumatic uh event if you then layer on top of that that a protective caregiver may have been the one who passed away and now that person is being forced to marry uh that adds another layer of trauma um and um and so what, what we're really talking about and what I think Helitz beautifully uh, illustrated as he talked about the intersections of the different forms of violence is that ultimately what we are talking about is chronic and ongoing toxic, toxic stress, sorry, I can't talk, uh, toxic stress to the body and the mind. Next slide. So again, we've been talking about the multiple uh, compounding uh, forms of abuse. Halib's used the word uh, lifetime of abuse. Um, and of course, that has short-term and long-term negative um, health outcomes for survivors. Um, we know that, um, you know, survivors of gender-based violence, forced marriage, uh, are more likely to um, develop um you know, gastrointestinal issues, gynecological issues, suffer at greater risk of suffering injury, um, adverse negative health outcomes for pregnant women uh, and newborns. And so we know that the body, um, you know, it, in, in absorbing all that toxic stress, toxic stress is being impacted. And, then, and, and when it comes to our brain, trauma impacts the way that our the brain codes information and our ability to recollect or bring back those memories, which again is very important when you're trying to obtain information to build a case. We know that from a lot of the legal work that Tahri does with our immigrant survivors. And I wanted to also highlight in particular that the ongoing exposure to uh, the stress hormones can impair brain development and the nervous system, uh, particularly for uh, young people, right? And this is because the brain, even though it stops growing in size uh, in early adolescence, the brain doesn't actually fully stop uh, maturing until our mid to late 20s. Uh, so from our teens, Teens to our 20s, we are still deliver, uh, developing that area of our brain that helps us with executive functions like planning, decision making, uh, problem solving, uh, which one needs uh, during a moment of crisis, of course. Uh, and then uh, one of my colleagues uh, earlier talked about the fact that, you know, within the context of gender based violence and forced marriage, we are often talking about people close to the survivor who are the ones perpetrating the abuse. And so that sense of self, uh, safety within self and our um, community and our environment uh, is taken away. Uh, and this is key. Uh, because when we're talking about supporting survivors, period, um, the the level of trust um, that they um, that that you know we're asking people to place or to give us, um, you know, may not match. We're talking about the fact that trauma changes our brain. Uh, it changes the way that we perceive the world. It changes, and so if we perceive a threatening world, we will behave and respond accordingly. Uh, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so um, 
you know, why, what does the science really tell us about, about trauma and why are we talking about all of this? Um, there are uh, three areas of the brain that I wanted to really like highlight for you all, because again, this impacts the way that survivors encode memories and then our, and then people's ability to then share what has happened to them. And it's the reason why sometimes survivors may have um, fractured, uh, fragmented memories, uh, may not be able to share details in chronological order. And so this gets to the core of that. Um, I'm not going to go super in depth because we know we're running out of time, but I wanted to put this in the uh, PowerPoint so that people can refer back to it. Um, there are three parts of the brain that are relevant when it comes to brain memories and trauma. We have the neocortex, which is the, the higher thinking brain, the one that allows us to do all the intellectual, executive functioning, conscious thought, self-awareness. It's the part of the brain that is allowing you all in this moment to absorb the information uh, and um, and then be able to retrieve it and apply it later on uh, in your in your work. Um, we have the limbic brain, uh, which um, is the emotional brain. The limbic brain, and this is really important, is the one that is in charge of memory coding. This is why when survivors are sharing their full narrative, uh, you know, and they share details about how they're feeling, we need to make sure that we are capturing those because though that is how their brain and, and um, was able to um, code uh, th those memories of what was happened to them. And that's actually the most uh, useful information that we're going to get in terms of then being able to help them retrieve additional information. Um, and then we have the instinctual brain, which, you know, deals with breathing, um, uh, blood pressure, and all the things that are unconscious. And so what happens during a traumatic event? Um, it leads our uh, survival instinct and survival rate reactions to take uh, control, uh, we are unable to access uh, the uh, neocortex or the prefrontal cortex um, that, again, that part that allows us to, um, to problem solve. Uh, it's why, for example, when people ask or a survivor who just experienced sexual assault, but why didn't you run? Well, you know, your, your, um, your, your, neocortex, you don't have access to that as much. What uh, kicks in is the limbic brain and the reptilian brain. Um, they get activated, our bodies and, you know, are producing a whole bunch of different um, chemicals in our body that allow us to respond, uh, right? And so there are specific parts. Um, um, so for example, what you need in that moment to escape the threat, right, and this comes from an evolutionary uh, process, is uh, for you to be able to um, fight, for you to be able to um, run away, right, and for in order for you to um, to function in that way, ensure survival, there are specific systems in your in your body that are going to uh, slow down to to let to make sure that you're gonna um, be able to do that, to, to be able to fight uh, and um, or, or escape. Um, and so these are, again, um, automatic reactions uh, that our brain puts in place in order to protect us. They are adaptive responses that the person has uh, in order for, uh, and it's the way basically that the brain was able to respond when that overwhelming level of stress is happening. Um, we know them as a uh, fight or flight, um, you know, uh, uh, response, but we also know uh, and have learned over time that there are other types of responses that the brain has. And the two la the two later ones that I add, the freeze and fawn, we typically see them um, as a as a response that uh, also shows up for people who have experienced multiple forms of abuse, like you know, like children essentially. Um, and so freeze uh, is the state of immobility when other options feel impossible. 
possible, right? If you um, are a child and the you know the the danger or the threat is a, a caregiver, you maybe are going to be unlikely to un outrun them or to fight them, and so their brain in that moment freezing was the only way that they could um you know um respond to the overwhelming stress that they were experiencing and the other is fawn and that you know goes back to appeasing the threat to escape greater harm and i mentioned this one because sometimes there may be situations where um a survivor details uh, signs or behaviors that we think are inconsistent with what our survivor should do or what our culture has told us a survivor uh, should do in situations of danger or threat. But in reality, this is how their brain um, allowed them to um, survive in the moment, or this is how their brain responded at the fear of you know, greater harm that if they did not uh, do what the perpetrator was asking them to do, right, that there would be a greater cost later on. Adriana, thank you so much. I'd love to move us to the section on the six principles of trauma. And if you, I know we have um, specific details here, but I love to, to, for you to help us think about, you know, when we're naming or when law enforcement is told to take a trauma-informed approach, right? Recognizing now everything that you shared, what's been discussed um, of the, the multiple forms of abuse that someone could be experiencing. What does that mean when we're talking about providing trauma-informed care? Yeah, I really appreciate um, the this sort of like um, guide and maybe if we can go to the next slide it might be easier to to review together but ultimately um, you know when I think about the role of um, law enforcement or first responders who are interacting with somebody who uh, is experiencing or at risk of experiencing forced marriage uh, or gender-based violence for other forms of gender-based violence for that matter um, is that you know you you can take these these as a guide right to think about how you can provide support. To me, safety uh, really comes down to uh, the emotional safety, right? If you're someone who's going to have just one interaction or a couple of interactions because you're doing some investigation, being mindful of your body language, of again, not rushing uh, survivors when they're, when, when they're telling you details about the abuse that you think are tangential, but that in fact, that's how their brain was able to um, code memories because memories are after, you know, are associated with our emotions uh, and our, our physical sensations um, that we are mindful. And Brianna talked a little bit about this of, you know, where you're interviewing somebody who is around so that they can truly communicate uh, what their experience was like trustworthiness and transparency to me is about uh, speaking about the role and the limitations of the role for, for the law enforcement or first responder, and then being able to communicate what will happen next in the process. That can be really helpful to a survivor so that they can make informed decisions about what they want to see happen. Peer support, you know, uh, I think in the context of law enforcement and first responders, it often comes down to offering community resources uh, to make sure that survivors are able to get the support that they need uh, with, you know, with uh, mental health providers, uh, support groups, uh, you know, Sada was talking about her role in mentoring. And so there are organizations that, you know, can provide that kind of connection. Next slide. Thank you, Adriana. Please feel free to, um, you can slow down. I know we're at time, but I, um, I know. To, uh, <laughs> you're okay. Now, yeah, please feel free to slow down for the okay. sake of the interpreters. And thank you everyone who, um, who is staying here uh, with yeah. us. Yeah. And, um, you know, when it comes to collaboration and mutuality, um, you know, this ultimately comes down to partnering with the survivor and leveling the power differences that exist, particularly around decision making. I want to highlight that these uh, six principles of trauma informed care um, are 
do not operate in silos and they interconnect, right? And so um, we talked about, um, you know, this, the decision-making and to me that's related to the empowerment voice and the choice, right? Again, being able to center the survival, um, pursue particular um, uh, particular processes, but that giving them an opportunity to share their story, informing them about what their options are, and 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 partnering with them so that uh, so that the process of engaging, you know, with systems is not re-traumatizing is key. Um, and then ultimately recognizing that some communities uh, have historically had diminished voice and choice, and so being able to um, center the different principles throughout uh, is key in order to make sure that we are um, being trauma informed in our practice. And so I really, if any, if you think, take anything, you know, from the trauma piece from this presentation is, you know, go Google the six principles of trauma and for care and think about how they apply to your practice and how you can apply them to processes and programs as well. Yeah. Thank you, Adriana, for that. Uh, and to all my colleagues here and for all of you who have um, who have stayed with us, uh, I think it's really critical to understand the um, what we truly mean when we use words, you know, like trauma and historic trauma, or uh, I know that um, service providers and you know, including law enforcement are often told to take a trauma informed approach, but I don't know how um, much time is spent, you know, helping folks to truly understand what that actually means. And so uh, I, I'll wrap us up by naming that, you know, we've included in this slide deck, uh, some simple questions that perhaps you can think about incorporating as you tailor your, um, your assessments, your interviews, your intake protocols, and, and think about, you know, in, in your process of questioning, do you ask questions related to marriage? Marriage, about the onset of marriage, how marriage came to be for that person, or do we immediately make assumptions, right, about, um, you know, about that um, relationship? And so we're hoping that all of you um, think, I um, think, uh, deeper about your role and how you can take perhaps a, um, a survivor-centered approach and that you see Tahare as a, an organization that uh, is happy to support uh, your, um, your learning, your advocacy. But if there's anything that we can do to ensure that you have the resources um, um, or materials that you may need to better understand this work, uh, please do let us know. Um, I know my colleague, Brianna, um, which I welcome to come back on video, the same for Sarah and Adriana, um, has shared in the chat many of the, um, of the reports and um, other pieces related to, um, you know, the work. Uh, I know there is a brochure, I'm not sure if it was um, already uh, dropped in the chat, but we did work on a pamphlet, excuse me, with the Department of Homeland Security on gender-based violence. It does name forced marriage, which we're really excited and, and proud about. Uh, and so um, if that has not been linked yet, I'd love for that to be uh, dropped in the chat. And again, I'll, I will pause now and appreciate all of you who are uh, staying with us a little bit longer so that we can answer some uh, questions. And so I don't know if Asara or Adriana or, or Brianna, if you have any questions that you would like to um, uh, bring up already. And if not, then maybe you can just have some couple of minutes for some reflection. As I wait to hear from my colleagues, I'll name that uh, I know a lot of folks have asked about materials and we uh, certainly will be sending the recording, the materials. Uh, there will be an opportunity for more information on the post webinar um, assessment uh, survey. If you are wanting us to do a part two, to do a deeper dive on maybe the legal section or uh, you know, you, now that you've gone through some of our reports, you know, there may be a deeper dive on some of those. 
we are happy to do so. Please name it. We're, we want to make sure that we're providing you with the information that truly would be helpful. Uh, and, and we'd love to hear it um, from you. Um, I see, um, Sarah, your hand is up, so please go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to thank um, Tahre and um, all of you for, for being here. And Adriana, thank you for going over um, the emotional trauma response, because I think it's something that is not very well understood, especially in these cases that are so complicated. Um, and I know in just my own personal history um, in having the police called and not really being able to identify what I was going through was really difficult and confusing. Um, and so I think just having this knowledge is just so important. And um, just knowing that sometimes a survivor or a victim of violence may not act a certain way. And it's just because they're trying to survive the situation. Um, so thank you for giving voice to that. It's uh, really impactful and I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, um, Sarah, for naming that. And I do think that it's uh, critical for us to be, uh, all of us in, in this work, to be more mindful and understanding these principles because not everyone uh, presents in the same way. And at times we have these expectations and it really is on us to ask the right questions, to uh, not be non-judgmental, to have an open uh, mind. And, uh, you know, you're not expected to know everything but uh, that I think is critical and for folks to know they have a place to perhaps um, you know talk to someone and or to be referred to an appropriate resource and um, I think a lot of times uh, as Brianna mentioned right families can make themselves seem very benevolent and the make their child or uh, the individual at risk to um, you know they paint them in a very negative light. And so that is another um, barrier, right, in, in, in seeking um, uh, support and connecting to services. Um, there are a few lingering questions um, in the chat and in the Q&A section. I don't mm -hmm. know if we have time um, now to discuss or if we want to follow up later. Yeah, thank you. I think we're, the, you know, I'm okay. I know that participants may be, you know, um, hopping off, but please feel free to, to stay on. Um, I'll take a look at that q and I see that we have a question regarding, uh, you know, not re-traumatizing a child if you, if there, um, there's, you know, female circumcision, no kind of follow-up care is there. I really appreciate this question and you naming the, you know, re-traumatization uh, what I will say is that uh, it's important to note when it comes to, um, you know, a, a minor, a child and, and cutting, uh, you know, they may not be aware of what you're bringing up to them. Uh, you know, we are not experts on this issue, but certainly recognize that connection. And uh, I, uh, I think you know, bringing in these trauma-informed principles that Adriana mentioned is, is critical, but that piece on how you approach this minor or this family is is, is key. Uh, I'll, I'll share that um, SEO, and I can type it in. It's a wonderful resource in the United States uh, with expertise um, on this issue. Um, and uh, I'm happy to make some connections there, especially if you're seeing the need for medical and clinical providers to be better in, um, informed. I don't want us to speak um, from a place of not having that deep knowledge on um, uh, on that approach when I know that work has been done specifically uh, for situations like this. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, I think this second question, but you know, Rima, it's a great question, right? Uh, do children, uh, you know, child marriage survivors enjoy the same legal rights as um, as uh, crime survivors, including when it comes to adjusting their immigration status. Uh, that, I mean, our immigration system, I'll name it, is just incredibly complicated. There is no way, I think, for any one of us to answer this question um, with a, like a yes or, or a no. Uh, I think there's always, an, it, it depends, and especially when it comes to children, which, um, you know, Sarah has named, um, you know, they in many areas of our legal system are not uh, granted the same rights as adults. And uh, I think in any anything involving a child who is a survivor, who is at risk of gender-based violence, and there's that intersection with 
immigration, we want to make sure that there is a knowledgeable immigration attorney that is advising you, that is giving you guidance. Um, and even if someone is not ready to perhaps name all the aspects of their situation, you certainly could speak to a knowledgeable attorney and maybe get some brief advice and counsel. Tahereed will does provide that in our service areas. And so I'll make sure that I'll move us ahead on um, the slide deck so you could see and have the contact information if any of you are working with someone who could benefit from um, any brief advice and, and counsel. Is there anything else that perhaps I may have missed or that Adriana, that you may want to just wrap us up with when it comes to thinking of gender-based violence and, and taking a trauma-informed approach? No, I think, you know, in the interest of time, um, I will leave it at um, go going for people to go back to think about the roles and how they can incorporate the, the different principles and in, in the process that they take when they're interacting with survivors. And if people have questions, you know, Helit, Brianna and I, and, you know, I'm sure Sara are happy to um, provide any kind of support in thinking through what that would look like for particular roles. Thank you. Again, I, I want to thank um, Sara for being here with us, for sharing more about um, her, I would say, a, a piece of her lived uh, experience um, and her advocacy and um, and really leading, um, you know, uh, being a key leader in the movement to end, you know, child marriage in, in the United States. I thank you, Adriana, for bringing in the, this mental health aspect, um, and as well as my colleagues who are supporting us uh, with, with tech, our interpreters, and of course, uh, my colleague, Brianna, who works directly day in and day out with the survivors who we uh, support. Uh, we hope you can see us as a resource, and that means, you know, whether it is to uh, maybe content material, creation, training, advising on the work that you're doing or a referral, or maybe you're working with, with someone and they're not ready to connect with us, but you would like some additional support, but please do reach out. We are happy to share about our resources and to also connect with the network of advocates uh, across the United States that we work with and who have a greater expertise. So again, thank you for your time. And we, we hope you found this to be uh, fruitful and we truly appreciate uh, you being with us today. Bye all.